processing. The NES and Super NES have had their share of premium quality in the 21st century with FPGA technology. Now it is the turn of one of my favourite consoles of all time. Finally, a proper modern reference quality version of the Sega Mega Drive, or Genesis if you're watching from those areas. Welcome to Analog's Mega SG. No shoddy emulation like we've seen from those consistently awful emulation clone systems made by Ag... Ag... Mm. I'm sorry, I just cannot say that name. You see, Analog say it right here. No emulation, 1080p, zero lag, total accuracy. Mega SG is not a plug and play toy. This thing is serious and after spending some time with it, I'm finding myself stunned. Here's the system itself and its European design, which I chose because I grew up with the PAL systems. <laughs> There are three other design options, US and Japan, which are obviously inspired by their respective Arius' Genesis and Mega Drive systems, and white. Probably don't need to explain that one. It's... it's... it's white. Out of the box, we also have a micro USB cable, which goes into this USB power adapter. We get an HDMI cable and a master system cartridge adapter, because the Mega SG can play those as well. But not only that, we have a spacer here to raise the system to the correct height for Mega CD compatibility, or Sega CD depending on where you're from. Look, here's the edge connector behind this panel. That's got to be one of my favourite features of this thing, though it's an interesting look compared to the original models. The Mega SG is on the smaller side. But not only that, sometime this year they'll also be releasing adapters for the Mark III, Game Gear, Sega MyCart, SG-1000 and SC-3000. How's that for flexibility? The design of the system is simple, sleek and compact with a very nice finish and it just feels really well made. I love the glossy plastic ring with the text on it that pays an homage to the original Mega Drive. It's just such a nice touch. And the symmetry of it reminds me of the Model 2. I opted not to have the controller included and we'll get to why at the end. But that's hardly a problem for me, as on the front we have controller ports that are completely compatible with all your original controllers, so I can use the wonderful arcade power stick amongst a smattering of others. Oh, except for these ones. Them modern screens don't like them like guns. We also have a headphone jack just like the original Model 1 had. At the back we have a micro USB port for power, and a single HDMI out for that crisp zero lag 1080p magic. On the top we have the power and reset buttons, and we have a real functioning cartridge port for all your original games which the system interacts with in real time for maximum authenticity instead of just dumping the ROM. It's also conveniently shaped to fit European, US and Japanese cartridges to fit. And yes, it will play them all as long as you have the region set correctly. It's compatible with just about every title and accessory for the system, and even works with Virtua Racing, which utilises its own processing chip inside the cartridge and won't work on your average one of the mill clone console. Apart from Hyperkin's Mega Retron HD, apparently. Well done, Hyperkin. Not even on an EverDrive Flash cartridge on original hardware will Virtua Racing run. Speaking of the EverDrive, the Mega SG is compatible with that too, so you can run all kinds of things like game hacks, unreleased prototypes, tech demos, other miscellaneous things like the 240p test suite, and you can also use it to boot the Mega CD in different BIOSes if you want. The only thing I know it's not compatible with, at least not for the moment, is the 32x add-on. This is because the 32X originally relied on having the RGB signal pass through via the Mega Drive's video out, and since the Mega SG is HDMI out only, it's currently not possible. It would also be a lot more difficult to develop an FPGA core for the 32X because of its more complicated technical architecture. Analog aren't saying it isn't possible to implement it in the future though, so only time will tell. On the side we have an SD card slot, which is only for firmware updates at the moment, but I think it'd be more interesting to see how certain tech wizards out there will utilise it. 
Without a doubt they'll find a way to get custom firmware on there and the ability to stick on ROMs that way and whatever else. That's inevitable. I wrote that bit in March. They've probably done it already. Yep. They have. Okay, so how does it look and sound? Nothing short of brilliant. Now I know I only recorded this at 30 frames per second, but that's because I'm using an older capture device. But the colours, the crispness and accuracy are to die for. This boot sequence? I heard it was actually developed using original hardware, a lovely animation that leads you straight into the menu which we'll go through in detail in a bit. So remember when they said it had zero lag? Well let me tell you now that it's absolutely true, at least to my human perception. This is fantastic for fast paced games like Sonic the Hedgehog especially in my case if you need certain jumps to be frame accurate. And now for the difficult bit. The sound. The sound of the Mega Drive is notoriously difficult to get right. Just listen to one of that, you know, that company's clone systems just to get an idea. Well, they say that with Yamaha's YM2612 audio chip within the FPGA, it sounds just as good, if not better, than the Mega Drive has ever sounded. And to some extent, I agree! While yes, it sounds incredibly clear and accurate, there are still some incredibly minor differences, but it's nothing that stands out at all, and if you wanted to change anything, there are so many ways to do so in the menus. This got me wondering though, could the sound be cleaner than the Mega Amp in my original Model 2? Even though in hindsight sound preference is subjective and it's down to the listener's personal taste, I might do a separate video comparing them anyway just because I think it's really interesting. Overall the presentation and accuracy is spot on. For the Master System side of things, it's the same story. Fantastic audio and visuals so crisp you could cut yourself on them. Oh, and if your game has FM sound capabilities, it'll play that by default, which is really cool! In the menu there is an option to toggle between the FM and PSG sound. If you feel like tinkering around with either the video or audio, there is a very nice array of options in the menu, perhaps too much for some. I won't be going into masses of detail about each and every option as there are so many of them, but I will be talking briefly about the ones that stick out to me. I say that now, just wait, this section will take you to next week. In the video section we have options for changing resolutions, changing screen size, choosing between different scalers and applying types of scan lines if you so wish, which look best in 720p by the way. You can also change the depth of the scan lines to your preference. In the advanced section we have the same options with some more things like width and height, extra features which includes masking the borders if you don't like seeing them, and dither blending which can make certain checkerboard patterns look more transparent like the waterfalls in Sonic the Hedgehog. It could also benefit other games general looks such as Virtua Racing or things like this image from Echo the Dolphin. There are buffer modes and also colour where you can change the red, green and blue values to your liking. Backing out now and entering the sound portion, we have the headphone jack volume, the ability to change the individual sound channel levels, the left and right panning of each channel, a negative 3 decibel output cut, enabling and changing the volume of cartridge and CD audio, swapping the left and right channels, why? Low pass filter settings in case you'd like a more filtered sound akin to the genuine hardware. Personally, I love the crisp and clear sound, so I don't use that. You have a high quality mode for the YM2612, why you'd ever have that turned off I do not know, ladder effect depth, and the ability to change the waveform of the YM2612, which can drastically change how things sound and should make for some very interesting experimentation.
I particularly enjoy the channel level option because you can listen to each individual channel and really dissect it if you want. I love that. The Master System mode has its own set of options too, but a lot of it's very similar and thankfully you can save those settings separately to your Mega Drive settings so they don't interfere. Okay, that did go for a while, but I glanced over so many other options as well. So I'll, I'll list here some of the other ones. Hardware region, LED options, skins, fonts, hotkeys, and... Look, there's a lot. I already spoke too much about them, and at the same time I don't think I explained enough. If you want to go super in-depth, I have to recommend that you watch My Life in Gaming's video or GameSack's video on the Mega SG. But that has me wondering how, or even why, someone would watch this video before theirs. I'm very late to the party. There is one other interesting option here at the beginning. Play Ultra Core. So, this is a game which comes built in with every Mega SG and it has a very interesting story behind it. The game was originally being developed in 1994 under its then name Hardcore by a company called Digital Illusions, known now widely as DICE. The game wasn't released and was lost until about 2001 when someone found it on an old dead hard drive. Isn't that lucky? It was also about 99% complete apparently, so not much had to be done to finish it. The game itself? It sounds great. It's animated well, it controls really nicely, but it's hard as nails. At least for me. <laughs> I'm particularly shit at it. Though, you know, I think the game probably would have done pretty well if it was released back then. Alright. Have I missed anything? Don't think so. I think I covered what I need to. I love this thing. To put it quickly and simply, it is a feature-heavy Mega Drive or Genesis that really screams quality. But is it all worth its price? The Mega SG is a premium system. That's what you must first understand. It costs 189 US dollars, which roughly translates to about 250 Australian dollars. Add to that the postage cost, which to Australia was about 79 US dollars, and that translates to about... Yeah, you get the idea. And now you know why I opted not to have the controller included, which would have added another 25 US dollars. It looks really nice though, and from what I've seen and heard, it's pretty damn good. FPGA systems are not cheap yet, and this is actually on the low cost side when compared to some of their earlier offerings like the original Analog NT or CMVS. In the end, it's up to you if you think it's worth it or not. Do I think it was worth it? Yeah, sure! Perhaps not the postage, though. Mind you, I am the same guy who spent half a grand on a Neo Geo AES. Retro collecting isn't as easy down here. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video or that I entertained you to some degree, and as always, I'll be back in 16 bits. Good evening, gentlemen. I have a new proposition for the next FPGA console. <laughs>